of this uh, system. You do, you all uh, work with different methods, um, optical methods, and many of you work with methods that measure uh, surface topography, because if you want to make something, and just now now need technology makes all sorts of wonderful devices, if you want to make something, you have to measure it. So, uh, one of the methods to measure and we think the best one is white light interferometry, um, which allows you to measure very small, uh, small devices, small surfaces, allows you to measure roughness. So for, if you want to measure roughness and small features, you have to have uh, high magnifications, so that's why you need the microscope for that. And um, fringes, if you use uh, interferometry fringes, they give you information about the object shape, and white light interferometry uh, gives you a very specific type of fringes, which uh, I will talk now about um, 
how they are created, what's, you know, how, they, how do we build the microscope uh, based on white light interferometry. Um, I will mention a little bit about how, we, how the fringes can be analyzed or, and what else can they be used for. They can be used for thick and thin film analysis. Uh, we also can modify some of the coherence uh, of the illumination in order to uh, provide us better measurements in some cases. Also, we modify objectives a little bit in order to do measurements, uh, some specific measurements uh, through glass or in liquid. And some, a little bit about uh, how we analyze diffractive structures and high aspect ratio um, features since they are, uh, they, they create some additional unwanted fringes. Um, and the, the most recent uh, development in the field is color imaging. Uh, and nowadays, with all the digital technology, everybody expects beautiful pictures, and they also do expect beautiful pictures from the microscope that they, that they use. And um, white light interferometer has a little bit of um, obscurations via fringes and via reflection from the reference mirror. So we'll talk about this, how we can um, get the beautiful images even with the white light interferometer. So uh, the interference microscope is basically based on the um, microscope, uh, which is uh, modified uh, to give us interfer uh, uh, interference. So here is the microscope, and basically what we do in order to do the to obtain white light fringes, we modify the objective. And I will go over a few uh, types of objectives uh, that are being used with the microscope. And microscope we are using because we want to look at the roughness and all the small features, one micron and below. So here is the, um, the, the easiest modification of the, the, the objective. So you have just a regular objective and underneath you put a beam split and cube. And um, with this cube, this cube allows you to split the beam into two and then recombines and we obtain fringes. For higher magnification objectives, 10 to 115x, usually the working distance, because of high numerical aperture, the working distance is very small, so it's difficult to put the beam splitter cube there. Um, it's just too big. So Mr. Miro uh, came up with the idea of putting beam splitter plate. So this is the plate that splits the beam into uh, into two, then we have to return this uh, reflected beam. Uh, so we put another plate to match optical paths, and um, then uh, we put a little reference mirror here, which is about the size of the field of view, a little bit bigger. First, I say we put it. It's not we put it. You can purchase such uh, objectives uh, from Nikon or Olympus. Um, and here. Um, I, I will, there will be a little uh, uh, automation project, a little kind of movie showing you how piece of the wavefront travels through uh, such objective. So here is a wavefront coming, it's split into two, reflected of the surface and the uh, reference mirror and travels back to the uh, objective. Of course the um, interferometric objectives, they, like all the all the objectives, they have there are some characteristic uh, parameters like numerical aperture, so um, uh, higher numerical aperture, higher magnification objectives, typically they have larger numerical aperture which allows you to observe smaller features, you just have better optical resolution. Uh, sometimes, um, if you, if you don't have, uh, so kind of, this is for the students, for the labs, if you don't have access to the um, uh, mural objective, you can just build your own interferometric objective using two of the same type of objectives, and you can do this in a uh, linear type of uh, modification. Uh, so you put two objectives, they have to be the same in order uh, to equalize optical paths, and you put a reference mirror here, at the same distance as at the best focus uh, of, the, of the objective 
um, as, as you would put the uh, sample in. But this objective, the linear type of configuration, is also it's very, uh, very useful if you want to measure a, a samples, you know, mechanical samples. Sometimes you measure big, uh, like propellers or you know, some big elements. So you don't want to have very low, very small uh, working distance. So then you can use long working distance objectives, and here you can have the working distance 20 or 30 millimeters which um, in industrial applications, you know, people on the floor, they, um, the production floor, they really uh, appreciate if they don't have to worry too much about that they will run with the objective into, the, into their, their sample. So those are major uh, types of objectives that are used um, on the uh, microscope. And you can, with these uh, objectives, you can uh, do phase shifting uh, interferometry, PSI measurements, as well as the uh, white light. Uh, you can do the, you can analyze white light fringes. So here is a little um, cartoon showing you that uh, all of you know that white light interferometry uh, provides uh, uh, this incoherent superposition for of uh, fringes created for different wavelengths, and then. All those wavelengths, when they are summed up, they create a very strong fringe here in the middle, while the fringe is uh, away from the best focus from the zero optical path difference, because that's how we set up the reference mirror at the best focus, the same as the, the sample. So this fringe basically tells you where is the best focus. So even if you have long numerical aperture objective, like 5x or 2x objective, and your depth of field is very large, the fringes will tell you exactly where is this best focus position. So here are, you know, here are the fringes, uh, as you would see if you put the color camera or if you would uh, just look at them with, with your eye, the best contrast, and then they are slowly uh, disappearing. So when you, once you know the position of this, uh, we'll go just now to the white light um, fringes in the, in the system. Here we have a beautiful uh, picture of white light fringes on some spherical surface. So this is the best focus. And here you see the fringes are slowly uh, changing color and also the, the contrast of the fringes is changing as you're going away from the best focus. So here this is, you know, that this, at this position, this is the best focus of your, of your sample. Um, um, many of you are familiar with phase shifting interferometry, yes? Many of you are using that. So you know the limitations of the phase shifting interferometry. If you have some surface with steps, you don't know exactly, you know, here you have this continuity. You don't know how to um, uh, assign the, the fringe number. Yes, you would have to go maybe to two wavelength interferometry, two wavelength interferometry, or you can use white light because here you can clearly you can see that you know if this is the best, you know the, this uh, highest contrast fringe, the next one would be here. So from this picture, you can approximately tell what's the uh, what's the step height. So it's not just because here you just you cannot you know this is like a, an unsolvable puzzle if you if you don't have any other information. So white light fringes allow you to measure those uh, surfaces with high steps as well as very rough surfaces. So if you see fringes, very crazy fringes, and there's like you cannot really unwrap them, then white light interferometry will provide you the full information because the the, uh, the position, this high contrast fringe, will tell you exactly kind of how to unwrap your fringes or provide the information about the height. So here is the little, um, so you will see how the white light uh, microscope uh, operates in order to uh, obtain the shape. You will see this objective is scanning through because just now we have to find this best focus at each pixel. So uh, just now our objective is moving, in reality it's moving a little bit faster, maybe not so long. 
um, and fringes are moving. On the right hand side, you've seen the fringes for the step height. And each pixel finds the best position, and from this, you, uh, you can obtain, create the, the height map, a uh, height map of your object. And um, so it is a very, very convenient and much more versatile um, method than phase shifting with interferometry because um, you know, we see that our, in our systems we have both methods and um, 70 or 80 percent of time people are using vertical scanning interferometry for measurement of all of the different industrial uh, parts. And here is what each pixel would see as you are scanning through focus. So this maybe it's a better you know, kind of representation of this, you know, how you, how you measure. This is what camera sees at different frames. And here what each pixel sees. So once you know how much, how fast the scanner is moving, you find those best positions and you can, you create the object shape. So it's really kind of something very, very intuitive. Yes, you are finding the best focus at each pixel as we scan through focus, but the uh, fringes help you to find this focus. And as I mentioned, you know, for uh, samples, you know, like you would not be able to measure this really with phase shifting interferometry, fringes are you know, too crazy, and those are still you know, quite nice and smooth. Sometimes when you look at the sample, it looks you know, basically almost like, you know, like speckle. So uh, what do we do with these fringes? I will tell a few words about how we analyze uh, them or how the fringes can be analyzed. So you collect the fringes, then you can uh, fit the curve and you can find the peak of the curve. You can calculate the center of mass of the function here of the fringes. You can use some correlation method or you can calculate for your uh, for your transform and look at the spectral phase. There are many articles about this. I don't have references here, but if you would like to um, have any reference, uh, just send me an email and I will provide all different references for different methods. Uh, here I will concentrate on um, center of mass calculation. Here are fringes you could calculate um, the center of mass. So basically, you know, where is the gravity? of the function directly on fringes. You can look at the difference, just take derivatives of the fringes, or you can calculate modulation using any of the PSI algorithms. Um, but the best one is really Larkin uh, algorithm because it's the least sensitive to any phase shift uh, miscalibration. So once you find once you find this peak, you can create the, the object shape. However, by looking at the peak, you don't have this great resolution, vertical resolution, as phase shifting interferometry. So in order to get a little bit better vertical resolution, get more um, information, more details on your, on your surface, you can do, uh, you, you can add the information about the fringe peak position. So your coherence, position of the coherence envelope will give you the information about the fringe order and then to this, you are adding position of the peak. And there are also different ways of finding this uh, best um, position of the, of the peak. You can find the best frame and use the PSI around it, or kind of like in here in this diagram, you just calculate the phase, you sum up all the uh, phases and you synchronize it with the, the uh, sines and cosine, and you obtain later the phase uh, at the, you know, kind of is going throughout the, uh, for, for the overall, you get the phase for overall position uh, of the fringes underneath the envelope, and then you combine those two. So you get position, you get this phase uh, fringe position, so this is like your modulo 2 pi fringes, and you combine it with the calculated coherence peak, and you get the phase, and you get the, the whole object shape. And here is the difference. This is what you get just if you look at the white light fringes at the center of mass at the peak. You see there is some noise. The vertical resolution is about three nanometers. If you combine these two pieces of information to combine position of the peak and position of the fringes underneath the envelope, you see this is a much more PSI type uh, quality uh, measurement. And this surface you could not measure with PSI because of the steps, um, 
but with combined methods you are getting a beautiful smooth surface and um, you, you can measure high discontinuity. This method, this method also allows you to measure, so mostly it's just for smooth surfaces or because um, at some point when the sample is, uh, is rough, the information about the face of the fringes basically is, is uh, useless. It's, it's not, it does not carry information about the, um, the object. Um, so they, then you have to rely only on the position of the, uh, uh, the envelope. But uh, we can, with this method, we can extend a little bit you know, how rough or how rough smooth surfaces you can you can measure. And in here I wanted to emphasize one thing about white light interferometry and, and PSI as compared to confocal, because I've heard that some of you are using confocal microscope. So in white light interferometry, as you see, regardless of if we use one X objective or hundred X objective, the white light fringes, the envelope of the fringes is pretty much the same. So it means the vertical resolution. Oh, so this is the here. This is the uh, just now the envelope of the fringes um, uh, presented here. So the uh, vertical resolution will be everywhere uh, the same for each of the objectives. In confocal microscope, because you are not looking at the fringes, it is uh, basically your your the envelope of the signal that you are analyzing that you can analyze also by using the center of mass. It will depend on the um, magnification, or mostly by, by the numerical aperture of the objective. So only high numerical aperture objectives give you a very small envelope, so you have your surfaces, the result is very smooth. If you use 5x objective, you have lots of noise and um, your measurement is not very, very precise. So the, kind of, this is the main, um, in a summary of the, the principles how the white light interferometry works um, and you can measure, we can use it to measure all sorts of different surfaces um, so from fringes, not necessarily color fringes but just the, you don't need the color camera, you need just you use black and white camera um, you can uh, analyze the fringes and you can get the shape and when you analyze these fringes it's the object is always in focus, so you always find the best focus, which is a kind of nice, good thing. You, you don't have any out of focus effect. And um, if you uh, add some uh, illumination, kind of post, you know, just kind of you show some shadowing effects from your surface, you can, you can uh, show a little bit more details um, of the surface. Here are some examples of what the white light interferometry is used for. Um, big uh, area of applications is a semiconductor. Um, but also it's not what we, you know, it's not used to uh, measure what we make. We also can measure how things are aging, how things are rusting, how things are wearing out with time. And um, the advantage of the um, of the whole package is so the, not only that you get the good uh, map of your object, but also you can do analysis. You can do uh, some separation by height and you can calculate how deep those pits are in the corroded uh, surface. Also, the surface topography measurement will give you information about the how, to, how uh, surfaces function. How you know? How, will there be a big friction? No friction in some um, elements. You you do not want uh, big uh, frictions, like in the engine blocks when the two pieces work together. Well, here you would want uh, some good friction in order to stop the the device. So this was for surface topography. Now I will go over a few um, applications to. Uh, measure not just surface topography, but uh, a few um, uh, other um, applications like measurement of the film. And because um, wherever you get fringes, if you get a reflection of the fringes, 
at the interface, you get two sets of fringes if this thickness is quite, quite large. So for this quite large thickness, large, it means two microns of, uh, up to about 150, you get two sets of fringes. The second set of fringes is created a little bit underneath the, uh, the interface here. So when you have this two set of fringes, you can measure the peak of this, of this envelope and peak of the, this envelope. And if you know grouping mix of refraction, if you know some optical properties of this material, you can convert optical thickness into a true thickness of the, of the film. So, um, you don't need to have a step in this case, you don't need to have a step. You may need to have some step just in order to calibrate if you don't know the optical properties of the material. But you can measure the, uh, the thickness of the material, and not only the thickness, but also you can measure the top surface and the bottom surface, as well as the, as the film thickness. So here, clearly, this is a cross-section of the fringes as going through focus. Yeah, so these fringes, they represent the top surface, the, these fringes represent the bottom surface. And there are all sorts of different um, elements uh, for which we would like to, uh, to know the, the thickness. Like, for example, for stents, you know, the stents are covered with uh, some coating, with some drug. So um, we would like to know if the coating is of the sufficient thickness. This is a picture also uh, taken with white light interferometer of a different film, of the thin film. Although, as you see, this, thin is, this, this film is not very uniform. But I really like the picture so, so much. I made a little movie here. It's, I call it, you know, impressions in interferometry. <laughs> so this is going through, through focus. You obtain all sorts of different colorful fringes. If you use color camera. But you don't have to use color camera in order to, to measure the, the thickness and to really uh, the method that I'm describing here just now uses only um, black and white camera. When fringes, when these two surfaces are very close together, you start having interference between the top and the bottom surface. That's why you see the colors. Okay, it's like here in this image, this is just if you look at the fringes uh, without any, any interferometer. You see there's an interference between the top and the bottom surfaces. And here in this area, there's no film. Uh, so, depending on the, on the film um, thickness, you have these different colors and there used to be methods where you were looking at the color and you, um, based on this, you were determining what's the film thickness. However, those colors are repeating itself, you, you get this kind of pinkish, uh, uh, greenish color kind of for different thicknesses. So, um, and we thought that with the, the uh, white light scanning interferometer, we can do a little bit better. So one of the methods to measure um, the, the film thickness uh, is based on uh, modeling of the signal. This is, so this method is not so straightforward as the analysis of the other fringes. Here, when you look at the correlogram, at the fringes is going through focus, they have totally different you know, shapes. You cannot distinguish between those two peaks. This is still 500 nanometers. You cannot distinguish the, 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 the there is, you know, there are some small peaks, but they are not necessarily you know, correct. What you have to do, you have to use so-called indirect method, like in ellipsometry or spectral or some other spectroscopy methods. You this is if this is the measured signal, we create the library of models for, the, for the, our system, we collect some information for the system, we collect library, or we create library of models um, of the correlogram or of the amplitude or the spectral phase, and we compare just now the correlogram or amplitude or spectral amplitude or spectral phase with those models and we create merit functions. So for some thicknesses, 
those models, they are matching really pretty well the, uh, the collected uh, data. So here, like for this one, this, this tells you that there's the smallest difference, so there's a best fit. This is what you would use for, for your solution. And here, spectral phase also shows, so shows similar solution. So four different thicknesses, you get those different correlograms, and you are matching or amplitude, spectral amplitude or spectral phase for those different thicknesses and measuring the merit function. But sometimes you have to help. But it's kind of like you know, lipsometry also, because if you, you, you may get those two solutions maybe too very close to each other. So you may end up with the wrong solution. So it is um, good to know, good to have some information about the sample. So here is the measurement of one of this, those colorful fringes that you've seen um, a second ago. Um, so here is the thickness map that we obtained from this measurement, which with ellipsometry would be very, very difficult to get. Ellipsometry is just a single point method and it's averaging over a larger area. So this uh, method gives you a really very nice um, uh, feel for the uh, quality uh, of your of your film. So you see that this, this area without the film really shows that there is you know, no film and here there is a red peak, you know, it shows that here this is a very high, you know, some, um, you know, some steps, some big de de defect in the film. Um, I'll go back just now to the, to the thick uh, films. Sometimes when you, when you measure the thick film, thicker the film is, then you have more of the dispersion and this film, uh, this set of fringes becomes weaker and weaker. So that sometimes you, know, you, may, you may not be able to detect it. So in order to help uh, the quality of the fringes here, what we can do, we can go to the lower numerical aperture objectives because the objective also has similar influence like um, a wide range uh, of uh, wavelengths on the on the envelope here. So if you go to lower numerical aperture objective or also narrower bandwidth, this set of fringes will be uh, stronger because you have smaller influence of the dispersion of the film. Also, if you want to measure things faster, uh, you may want, you, may, you don't need, because normally we sample approximately four pixels per fringe. This gives you the best, like in PSI, this gives you uh, the, the best quality of the, uh, of the data. But if you want to measure faster, as I said, you know, the, in, in uh, industry people want to measure things uh, in no time. So um, they measure, you can measure it with, <coughs> you can sample it much finer, three, you know, three times, you can take every third sample or every fifth sample or more in order to do the measurement faster, but then at some point you are running out of the fringes. So really, if you want to measure faster, you want to um, change, you want to go from white lights to green lights, so you want to make the um, bandwidth a little bit lower, and so here you will see So this is the measurement at 1x, at the normal speed, with white light fringes. So you see fringes are going slowly, and there's just only very few of those fringes. If you uh, make the envelope longer, so if you uh, change your coherence, temporal coherence of the signal, you see, the, the measurement was done in no time. I, I, will go, I will run this again. But this is thanks to this that we had that we change temporal coherence that we have more fringes just now in the, um, on, on the sample. Um, sometimes you want to measure through the chamber. Sometimes you want to measure things in um, some uh, via protective glass or liquid. If you if your optical path is not matched well, you, your fringe fringe quality is not good. But once you put the two compensating plates here your quality of the fringes is very good. So 
and sometimes in order to help fringes, you also have to change a little bit design of the system. And here are uh, here is a picture of cells of in liquid, um, also as measured with uh, white light interferometry. Measuring very narrow structures, it will be very helpful to have a kind of telecentric illumination. Then the light travels better to the structures, and you have stronger signals from the bottom. So again, it's we need to help fringes a little bit so we can analyze them. But there's some very strange thing happening when you go to very narrow structures. You would kind of think that the fringes always follow the shape of the object, but here in this case, look, this is the narrow trench here, but we have fringes here in the void. There's no, there's no structure here, there's no surface. And the fringes, we call them ghost fringes. So somehow we have to be aware of this, we have to be able to detect and uh, ignore those ghost fringes in order to get correct shape. Some surfaces are very, very tiny. Um, so this is surface of just only two microns and the, uh, one micron tall, so it has very high slopes, you know, very small, you know, small features only are separated only by a few microns. And um, then, I'm not going into details here, but here you have to carefully uh, select how you, if you are taking face of the fringes or if you are taking the um, position of the fringe of the um, of the fr uh, fringes because you cannot trust the position of the fringe or position of the white light um, envelope everywhere. So this was everything so far about the the metrology um, and what we can measure. Now I will go over uh, the the recent thing that we are adding to the system. And um, I will talk a little bit about how do we get the good presentation uh, of the sample, good image of the sample. Because, um, as I said just now, if you are looking at all these maps, this is just a color-coded map. It kind of like, you know, if somebody wants, so it's like, okay, can you measure this for me? And then we provide them, you know, kind of map, map like this. Yeah, so, so here, here, this is your sample. We can give you some a little bit more details if we do some show some shadowing. Of course you can get all of the geometry and you know beautiful cross sections and so on. But now people want in addition just the map. They want to see how their sample really looks. So you can measure the you can have a color coded map or uh, you can create an image of the object as really it is. So in order to get a color image of course we have to have uh, red, green, and blue. So you can use color camera, you can use sequential illumination, you can use three cameras, but you get those three correlators, red, green, blue, and then you can convert this information uh, to, the, to color. Of course, here, this is not a direct color of red, green, you have fringes, you have influence of the reference uh, mirror, but um, after the analysis, after going through the sequence of the images, um, you get rid of the haze that comes from the reference mirror, you get rid of the fringes, and you bring the image into one focus, and or you can create a 3D map of, of this um, uh, object. So here is the, um, kind of on, on the system, you can uh, allow the user to monitor how the face map is being built during the measurement, and you can do all the popular stitching. You can get the um, colored, coded height map of your uh, object, like coin in this case, or the full 3D or full color image of the sample. The color is not always so easy to obtain. So in uh, many systems, um, if you, if, uh, why it's not easy to obtain? Because specular surfaces, they just it's kind of like mirror. Which you see basically just the reflection uh, of the uh, object or the, or the illumination. And diffusive surfaces, they scatter light into all different directions, and this is where the information about the color is. So if you use higher numerical aperture objective, you will have more information about the color but he wants to measure something you know, with small numerical aperture. So in order to help this color, you add side illumination. 
So here we have side illumination that from the side we are illuminating object and then the light goes back to the objective. Of course, besides just normal that you can you can change some reflectivity of the beam split or the reference mirror in order to get less information from the reference. So this is this is what you get when you uh, if you use 5x objective and if you look at the paper with interferometric objective, this is what you see. Kind of nothing. You can see fringes, yes, you, but it's difficult to find those fringes because it's difficult to see the sample. But if you use side illumination, here that's what, it, what, what you see. So now you have ease of use of the system. You can find uh, sample focus, you can navigate on sample much better, you know where you want to measure, and then you have also good image of your of your sample. So here, if you use color camera, from seeing nothing, you see nice colors, and you can obtain, on top of the 3D height map, you can obtain colors. So now you can present not just only the color-coded map, but, oh, this really looks like my paper. Now I see what I am looking at. Now I see, you know, where is top, where is bottom, you know, what's how they, I can separate different elements by color, so I can analyze how tall are the pigments with uh, red versus blue, and so on. Also in other industrial samples, different circuit, uh, printed circuit boards at some different processes, you would see nothing here. Now you, you really see where your sample is, you measure it, and you measure it with the, with the height. This is a very nice example because this map does not really, you know, uh, uh, remind you, you know, this, the, the, you don't see like higher places wherever those pizza pepperonis are. <laughs> um, so, and you would see, you know, you would see really nothing uh, in the uh, in the live video. Now with the site illumination, you clearly see where you measure, and you can just now clearly you know, correspond, you can make a good correspondence between the different areas. You can choose by selecting by color, we can choose the area, we can measure what's the roughness here versus in the areas where the, there is no uh, print. So, um, so, so far, uh, the white light interferometry was delivering excellent metrology. You could measure all sorts of different samples. It's really, you know, it's kind of difficult to, to name what you could not measure. Uh, measure some biological samples, you know, skin, uh, through some uh, uh, material and through all sorts of different technological uh, samples. Here are my son, he had some uh, project on grasshoppers and so he wanted to measure the eye of grasshoppers and so the eye of the grasshopper. That's not what we usually measure, but you can measure this. Uh, but just now, in addition to the great metrology, we, we add the, uh, the kind of commercial side. Um, this is, you know, in our digital, digital age, everybody expects good pictures. So uh, here, there are good pictures. Even just without color camera, you can see a good representation of what the sample looks uh, like in black and white colors. So here you have uh, some metal coins, pieces of metal coin. Here is a solar cell. Um, here is the circuit, some printed circuit boards, and here are just some pieces uh, of paper, which you know otherwise we, without the side illumination and without the um, color camera or RGB illumination, we would not be able to. Um, So, um, this was my overview of white light um, interferometry. So this is kind of more of the, 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 in, the overview. Of the, for the science, if you would like to know more about the algorithms and uh, some more principles of how things, how color is obtained and so on, um, you can contact me. Uh, but those measurements are really very fast. And what I nice, nice think about this is on our contact as I think all of us that work with optical methods, we can always emphasize it that the, our method, we don't really touch the sample, so we can measure them soft samples. It's great uh, resolution, a white light interferometry has great resolution. 
which is independent of the magnification uh, of the objective. And we can measure different smooth and rough surfaces, but also measure the thick and thin films um, through the copper plate in liquid. Uh, narrow and diffractive, diffractive structures. We also can measure uh, things in motion. I did not talk about this, but you can look at the samples that are vibrating very fast and you can stroke the light, or you can look at a very small, slow motion. You can uh, use different kinds. You can use like at the, at the heart rate of uh, some small like zebrafish um, embryos, or you can also monitor how chocolate is melting. This would be a nice experiment. Um, and just now, uh, the color image uh, and grayscale image, this is a, a good visual addition, good for presentations later if you want to show you know, somewhere. And also it gives you a good feel for you know, where you have measured, what you have measured. So just now we have great metrology and great imaging. If you would like to have more information, you can contact me. Uh, here at this at this email address. Can we put it there? Yes, okay. It's a more general name. White light interferometry it means that you are using the white light part of the spectrum to create the low coherence. But also you can, you know, like optical coherence tomography, they also use uh, um, envelope. They use low coherence, but at a different spectral range. And uh, the, the pictures or the, you know, the measurements you can do not necessarily just with the whole white light spectrum. You can use 40 nanometer, 100 nanometer, you know, 60 nanometer bandwidth at any of the of the wavelengths, and you know, it may depend, you know, if what kind of sample you are using. Sometimes, like for rough samples, because you have more fringes are created this, during the scan, so it sometimes you get more data when you measure um, rough samples. So low coherence interferometry is a broader term for the white light interferometry. Question another one. Have you exploited the channel spectrum? Which, which channel spectrum? Um, channel spectrum? Yes. No, I have not. Question? More questions? We were looking at the super continuum for you know, to have as narrow possible um, fringes, but those sources are still expensive. <laughs> Yes, it is. You know, okay, I'm not an expert in this area, but yes, if you look at some sonars or even ultrasound, it's kind of it's a similar thing. You are finding a you know position of the signal. Yes, and a white line signal. Yes, and, and it's going through focus or is it scanning through some range. Yes, yeah, so like you know, like all the uh, the SARS is I think you know, it's it's a. Uh, it's one of the methods that it's it, yeah you can you can you can learn from you know the, the, those areas they can learn from each other and they overlap in some ways. Yeah, because you may use also as you said several several wavelengths that also you can you can make a scan of wavelengths in order to have a jerking yes. signal mm -hmm. to more or less kind of measure the same kind of things. Yes, it's just it's uh, it's. You haven't tried no, we have not uh, tried chirping, we did look at the spectral interference, so when you uh, just uh, have white light um, and then you use the spectrum, so you use, look at the spectral fringes, which is a little bit different than the chirping. Now, it's, I think the chirping, you know, it, it's still, for very fast and inexpensive measurements, it's 
maybe not exactly there yet. And I could learn from somebody a little bit more about the chipping. So.